Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. It's November already, and I'm in a boutique techno mood. Why not review the film franchise that started it all? The Terminator. Yep, with Schwarzenegger playing a cyborg from the future, who goes back in time to the year 1984 and was programmed to kill Sarah Connor a young woman who happens to be given childbirth to the leader of the resistance John Connor and a soldier who came back in time from the future to protect her it became a breakthrough role for writer and director James Cameron who at the time was just doing small budget horror films like Piranha only to later become very big by doing his uh, screenwriting credit for films like Rambo First Blood Part 2 as well as working on the movie that's a sequel to Alien by Ridley Scott simply called Aliens and then next thing you know he went on to do films like the Abyss, the sequel, Terminator 2 Judgment Day, which is known simply as T2 Judgment Day. <laughs> he also produced um, several of his works, too. I mean, yes, he did films like True Lies, and as well as uh, Titanic, and of course, Avatar. Not to mention, Writing the script and producing Alita Battle Angel. <laughs> okay. But this film, of course, did become a franchise that it spawned it out a not only for the second movie, but we also have T3, Rise of the Machines, um, Terminator Salvation, Terminator Genesis, yeah, and just recently that just came out. Terminator Dark Fate, all released by separate studios. Yeah. Because this movie was released by Ryan Pictures, joining in with um, Hemdale Film Corporation, and even though it's only a small budget of four million, double to six, it became a box office success, made Schwarzenegger a huge star. You know, after doing those uh, Conan films from producer Dino De Laurentiis and he has done some other stuff before that I mean mostly because he was a well-known famous bodybuilder from Austria yeah. and legend has it because this is the film that gave him his catchphrase I'll be back And it also has the elements of not only as a sci-fi action thriller, but it also has like a bit of horror and a bit of uh, a romance and so on and so forth for survival. Now this Blu-ray I picked up was a long time ago. I got this at Target for five bucks back in 2011. Great deal. But this is the original Blu-ray release uh, from Sony joining in with MGM because at the time um, MGM had a deal with Sony well they bought them out like 20% of it uh, in 2005 and after MGM was having some financial problems um, and, but for a while uh, Sony did have the rights to MGM and they started uh, releasing all of MGM's library for a while, you know, under the deal until uh, MGM Home Entertainment had transferred to 20th Century Fox Home Entertainment as it remains today until, well, they wound up being transferred to different companies because already MGM is now uh, serving uh, boutique releases from many companies like Twilight Time, Shelf Factory, Olive Films, Kino Lober, 
um, you name it. And we already know Fox is now Disney, part of it. But whatever. <laughs> okay. Oh, and of course, that's what it looks like. That's how all these original Sony releases look like at the time, where it has the uh, the artwork in a blue with a mixture of what's supposed to be some electronic scenes or something like that but that's how they used them at the time nowadays they start changing them or they use their own artworks the transfer was ahead of its time I mean it's an old film made in 1984 well filmed in 83 but came out in 84 so it's what you expect for the transfer but they did provide a new 4K restoration and remaster in 2014, so... I, I don't have that release, but if I ever thought about getting that, that would be nice. Uh, I don't mind double dipping it. But that's where it leads to disappointments, because unfortunately, for this release, as well as the 4K uh, remastered release, we only get a few features from the 2001 Special Edition DVD, which is seven deleted scenes, created the Terminator, visual effects and music, and Terminator, a retrospective. And it had trailers for selected Sony films. Well, Fox is a different story under MGM. So, what can you do for this release? And not to mention, even uh, back in the day, I mean, when the original film came out and then later they put it on home video, they always had the original uh, sound effects, you know, where you actually hear all these gun shooting effects that they got, something that you'll never find you hear. Um, they had to change that later on. They had to update it for all these previous releases from like from HBO, home video, or or at this rate, uh, Image Entertainment under uh, Hemdale Home Entertainment, so they had to you know, provide some newer changes here and there. It's been that way ever since. So can't do anything about it though. But if but you know that's the thing. If, if they ever thought about re-releasing this film again, I hope they start. Um, we think twice and start bringing back the old features from the past and start uh, maybe adding new new features joining in if they can. I mean, I know they're getting older now, but hey, you know, they, it would have made this release much better. And also throw in the original mono track. Yeah, because as you know, this film was shot in mono. Um, they didn't use Dolby Stereo, so that was a... So they knew that this wasn't going to be able to become, as we speak, a a bigger budget film. Nope, it was going to be just a small budget. I mean, and that's in that glance. So it's what you expect to see. But otherwise, that's more than what you expect. Okay. Anyway. So the original idea of this was that Cameron was at Rome um, while well, during the premiere of Piranha 2 The Spawning he felt ill and suddenly he had a dream that he wanted to create something that he didn't expect it to be a metallic torso holding kitchen knives which is going to become basically <laughs> a slasher film which was going to be inspired by director John Carpenter in the take on Halloween but so that was a bit of a launching pad for him that apparently his agent didn't like the concept so because of it well his agent had to move on to something else so so Cameron dismissed it but he went back to Piranha California to stay home with science fiction writer Randall Franks um, decided to come up with a draft for the Terminator which would turn into an influence to all these 50s and 60s uh, sci-fi uh, TV and movies and stuff 
including the outer limits. Um, and figured, you know, with a mix of other stuff included, that this will actually work, you know, as a sci fi action thriller. And that's where it came to be. So he joins in with producer Gail and her, who's the head of uh, production company Pacific Western, because she previously uh, worked at New World Pictures as the assistant for Roger Corman, which I know Cameron had worked together. And then suddenly they teamed up and they joining in with uh, producers uh, Derek Gibson and John Daly, the head of Hendale Film Corporation and distributor Orion Film Corporation, Orion Pictures Corporation to to light it up and and that's how we got it. The only thing they had to get now is to find who's the actors to play the part and uh, originally Cameron was suggested to have either Stallone or Gibson. Yep, hard to believe because they had an inside joke on that on Last Action Hero. <laughs> when they show that Terminator 2 poster and they had Stallone on there. But they dropped down and also O.J. Simpson was another choice but also turned down too. So, but Cameron didn't felt like this was the right choice so little did they know because Schwarzenegger was under contract with De Laurentiis that he would soon join in. I mean Schwarzenegger had to read the script, hoping this would be in something that he didn't expect to see, and what do you know? The rest is history. But the fact is, uh, according to Cameron, I mean, he thought that Cassius Schwarzenegger wasn't a good choice. I mean, that's what he thought. Like, the whole idea just wouldn't work. I mean, seeing that he's supposed to be in a Federation unit, that you probably wouldn't spot a Terminator in a crowd industry somewhere. But he did prove them wrong. Once uh, he got his performance and, and once he plays them exactly what we expect. So, there you go. And of course, Cameron also casted uh, Michael Bean to play the role of, of a soldier named Kyle Reese. Because originally they were going to have Steen, rock musician, but Apparently he wasn't available, but they fought, even though he f Cameron did f felt pretty skeptical about it, I mean, he felt like it was going to be pretty silly to cast him, but mostly because, um, well, from what I saw in the features, though, Bean was actually working on a play, that's why he was given a sudden accent, uh, but he was afraid that, you know, that he won't be able to play the role exactly what we expected. So, but I know he, even Bean didn't want to change the accent, but because he wanted to stay in character for that part. Um, but he did later change it though, and, and he got it all. Plus, they were going to go for a love story in a way, and that's where we got Linda Hamilton, because she just previously did the, the Stephen King adaptation of the film *Children of the Corn*. So she finished. Uh, so after that film was finished, I mean, she was chosen for the part of Sarah Connor. Yeah. And there we go. Because I know they were going to get Roseanne Arquette to audition, but well, wasn't available. Well, let, let's get to the review, and I'll probably explain some more about other stuff too, like the effects and everything. So. Just want to keep it straight here. So it stars Arnold Schwarzenegger, Michael Bean, Linda Hamilton, Paul Winfield, a yeah, legendary actor from films like Sounder. He was also in the TV series 227. Come to mind. Lance Henderson, who would soon went on to do films like Aliens, also uh, the movie uh, Near Dark. A vampire um, set in the road uh, picture. Um, of course, went on to do the TV series Millennium. He was also in the movie Pumpkinhead. And 
as well as House Free, uh, The Horror Show, among others. Earl Boyne, um, who's been in like several uh, TV appearances of many shows, like Mama's Family, Elf, um, so on and so forth, but yep, yeah, he's been in all the other, well, at this rate, three of the Terminator films. Best Mata, Rick Wasabik, yep, who later went on to do Top Gun. Uh, Bill Paxton, God rest his soul. Uh, also, I know Paul Renfield passed away a long time ago, so keep that in mind. Uh, but Bill Paxton, yep, uh, long before he went on to do once again, Aliens, and as well as Near Dark, uh, Predator 2, Twister, um, A Simple Plan, um, among others that he's done in his entire career. And he will be missed, sadly. Uh, Brian Thompson, who later went on to do the film Cobra, among others. Um, Murray-Ann uh, muller Raleigh and Dick Miller also passed away, but he was from the movie Gremlins, as well as several of the films uh, that was directed by Joe Dante, because he often cast uh, Dick Miller, also had went on to other stuff too. Great actor. Anyway, it's written by James Cameron, with some screenwriter credits by Gail and Hurd, and additional dialogue by William Wisher Jr., which Gail and Hurd is the producer, and is directed by, once again, James Cameron. The movie begins set in the future of Los Angeles, California in 2029. A nuclear war leads to a battle between the humans and the machines that's controlled by Skynet. So, we have the Resistance and those other in those machines, that's where you see the drone passing by, and then you see those uh, those other um, cyborg uh, tanks uh, coming by with all these uh, skulls, human skulls arriving, and they're shooting all these lasers around, going after a huge battle here. Well, we meet a cyborg assassin known as the Terminator, T-800 uh, model series. That's played by Arnold Schwarzenegger, who just arrived in the year 1984, all fully naked, and wants up at Griffin Observatory. Yeah, that's the place I went to where you go around exploring astronomy, looking at the planets and studying, doing all this other stuff over there, like looking at those telescopes. Yeah, I've been there. That's where he meets those... Um, Three punks, two of them played by Bill Paxton, who is actually the the, the punk that has all that uh, sharp uh, blue hair and has that uh, tire marks on his face yeah. and some crooked teeth. Yeah, that's him. And Brian Thompson, is another punk, and there's another punk to join in. So anyway, they're just hanging around, drinking, you know, looking at the telescopes. And that's when the Terminator arrives, all naked, asking them for their clothes. Yeah, making all these uh, jokey dialogue. So he threatens them to take off up their clothes. They refuse, so then he has to stab um, Thompson's character straight up. I'm not so sure if Paxton's character got killed. I know they say that he did, but... Obviously, maybe he got killed off screen, or we just never know what happened next. But I don't know. So, anyway, the other punk actually stripped off the clothes, gave it to the Terminator, and that's where he's all dressed up. So, then later, he's about to go straight to the streets of LA to find a telephone directory under the name of Sarah Connor, because he's programmed to kill this young woman. and. Then we have a human soldier named Kyle Reese, played by Michael Bean, who was sent back in time from the same year. Of course, he had to find some clothes that he needs, which he borrowed the pants from 
a, uh, a homeless person being chased down by cops wants up at the department store and try to find some other clothes that he needs to dress up and then find some a shotgun and some ammo that he needs to stop the Terminator. So anyway, so Sarah Connor played by Linda Hamilton is a young woman works as a waitress um, hangs around with her friends including the, her roommate uh, Ginger Ventura played by Bess Mata, who actually has a boyfriend named Matt Buckingham, played by Rick Rosabick. Yeah. So, they do the usual stuff, you know, going to places, clubs, movies, the usual stuff. She also has a, a pet iguana <laughs> named Pugsley. <laughs> yeah, named after the Adams family. <laughs> Love that. Uh, during the next day, uh, the Terminator had went to a local gun shop just so he can collect all the guns and animals that he needs so that way he'll be able to go around shooting and killing Sarah but he did shot the gun shop owner who was played by Dick Miller even though he was telling them what he wants and tell them how to control the, all these uh, guns, you know, shotguns, all this other stuff but then he was like put the ammo in there okay. So, of course, they all, so it's it's a killing spree where Terminator and Reese had looked straight to the telephone directory to find where Connor is located. So when the Terminator went to a, a local neighborhood to find out where Connor is staying at, or, or what seems to be, well, it turns out that the Terminator shot the wrong Sarah Connor. Yeah, and then, of course, he did took the car that he actually s took his fist and smashes through the, the windshield and, and drives by. And then goes to certain places to kill all the Sarah Connors out there. The only one that um, he hasn't targeted yet is the one that we all know. Yeah. So now we know that um, Connor is, is the victim. And she's in danger. So, so what happened was, though, she winds up um, trying to call the police after she's just saw the news um, about the report of of all the deaths of the Sarah Connors. So it basically describes as the phone book killer, and that's where you know we meet these two cops, Ed Trackler, who's a police lieutenant played by Paul Renfield, and Hal uh, Bokovic, who's a police sergeant, played by Lance Henderson. So meanwhile, Sarah Connor wants up um, straight at, at a local club called Tech Noir. Sarah was also trying to call uh, Ginger and Matt to see if they're doing all right, you know, because they're just hanging around, you know, just, um, you know, Falling asleep, having sex, you know, trying to make some, you know, some night snacks and stuff like, <laughs> like a peanut butter sandwich or so. While uh, Ginger is like listening to music, and then she suddenly spotted uh, Pugsley, the pet iguana that's hiding somewhere. Until the Terminator shows up at Sarah's apartment and suddenly brutally killed by throwing Matt straight into the window and back and forth into the bedroom and straight out the door and then later he shot uh, Ginger in the back just when she was about to run away shut down completely where then he was, she was about to call the police hoping that they'll be on their way and winds up in a safe place until the Terminator arrives and then Kyle Reese joins in to save her. Yeah, that's where it has a violent shootout happening at the club. And they're about to escape. All the cops were arriving. That's where we had a long chase scene between the Terminator and Reese and Connor. So anyway. But of course, yeah, Terminator had pursued them by 
taking the police car. You know, this is where he changed his, uh, his voice of the police officer, and that's where it has that particular chase scene all the way around Broadway and in Los Angeles, and then they wound up straight into the parking lot, and Kyle was trying to explain to Sarah Connor that how did the Terminator came here, because the official intelligence defense network, which is known as Skynet, uh, became self-aware that in the near future that initiated a nuclear war, and that's what happened. We learned that Sarah's uh, future son, named John Connor, who happens to be the leader of the resistance, that's 35 year, 35 or 40 years from now. Uh, which would be 40 years from now that he'll be the the savior to save mankind from, hap from being destroyed. So, anyway, and while and Rice's no, sorry, and Reese's dialogue comes exactly as described from the Terminator is that it can't be bargained with, it can't be reasoned with, it doesn't feel pity or remorse or fear and absolutely will not stop ever until you're dead so yes no one can stop the terminator unless there's a better way to to destroy it way all the cops had came during that violent chase scene once again you know with all the shootouts they're taken in by of course um, Ed and, and Hal for questioning. That's where we meet a criminal psychologist, uh, Dr. Silberman, who's played by Earl Boyne, who concludes that Kyle might be paranoid and delusional, not to mention wacko. Then the Terminator, who's already been shot down, crushed a little bit from the accident, decided to go for repairs. I mean, this is where we begin to see some body tissue, you know, doing, performing some surgery. We see all these an intel uh, skeleton uh, parts, uh, bone-like uh, metal-like uh, parts that you saw. Yeah, kind of like uh, skeleton bones. Um, he was trying to perform a surgery, trying to fix it, you know, at, at, by using the exacto knife to cut through and and then all the other tools to fix it completely. So hopefully he'll be able to move his his fingers and so I mean later on he would also perform some surgery from his uh, particular eye yeah ugh. I mean and that's where it begins to reveal the eye uh, that has a uh, the infrared uh, visionary that you'll be able to see all the way straight where it has all these um, informations and all this other stuff too that it can be controlled because after all the cyborg thinks like a computer so you can do everything with it. I mean he's a cyborg that's a powerful metal indoor skeleton that's a killing machine so anyway so next thing you know the Terminator had arrived just as uh, Dr. Silverman left and going straight to the um, the police um, the police officer just to, just for an appointment to to find the Sarah Connor because he was staying at because she was uh, staying in and tried to sleep so she, so she'll be protected at the police station. I mean and that's where we begin to hear his catchphrase, "I'll be back." So. Then uh, he left and then suddenly takes the car and just drive all the way straight through the, the police station and crushes the, the police officer and then, and then goes around uh, taking out all of his guns and even the, the machine guns that he has and starts uh, killing and shooting all these cops around. And that's when they're already under attack so yes all the cops were, were killed well half of them might have survived but you never know so both um, 
So both Kao and Sarah had, had escaped from the police station and decided to stay somewhere uh, in a safer area, like under the tunnels, uh, just when they drive by. And then they're trying to explain about, about John Connor, about, about how everything's going to happen later in the future and, and yeah just you know doing the usual stuff you know having some bit of romance and and just talking about what he looks like you know and has that John Connor has the same baby eyes that Sarah has all this stuff you know the usual they went to a local hotel to stay in for a while and you know just so um, Reese can go around to to a local store just to buy some supplies so that way he can build some some bombs so that way he'll stop the Terminator yeah meanwhile Connor is just taking a shower you know trying to get everything ready so that way if the Terminator arrives um, that's when they'll start to escape and they did <laughs> so that's where we have another sh chase scene where where the Terminator is riding on the motorcycle continue to go on on this mission to to go after Sarah Connor and Cal Reese so so yes we so they had to drive by on another truck 4x4 four four truck going straight into the tunnels of Los Angeles uh, Reese was about to throw all these bombs at the Terminator but it keeps missing yeah clouds of smoke uh, explodes and and he passes by continue to move on and then and then Terminator shot his arm and and then hoping he'd be ready to throw in his next bomb which then that's when the Terminator that's when the the Terminator suddenly crashes through their cars they they later escape only only that the Terminator got crushed by a truck driver, a uh, a tanker truck, yeah, led by these two uh, truck drivers, and they, yeah, you know, they both. Well, he, the Terminator came by, already crushed, and came out, um, took down the the truck driver, and then telling the other truck driver to get out. Yeah. So now uh, the Terminator chases them around. Um, through the the tanker truck, and then later, well, Reese puts in the bomb straight into the tanker truck, and tries to find a place to hid uh, just to get away from the explosions. Went inside a dumpster, and just when the Terminator was continued chasing Sarah Connor, before she tried to find a place to to hide, and then then finally the the truck explodes completely and that's when it was all burned down to a crisp now they thought both Kyle and Sarah finally did it like now this is gonna finally change everything for the future so we don't have to see him anymore but not quite because now as far as this concern he became the ectoskeleton all metal and it just moves um, a little slowly but surely but it's going as fast as it can to go after both of them then they wind up straight into the factory it turns out to be the factory of Cyberdyne Systems which happens to be the company that created all these cyborgs or soon going to become the future of, of robotics so Kyle was already, you know, shot down, you know, he's already losing blood, having trouble uh, trying to get up. He's trying to start the machine so that way the, the Terminator won't track them. But he's struggling pretty hard and then he has his next bomb left, leading to a fight between Reese and, and the Terminator. Once they try to go up to the, the stairways here. He throws one more bomb left, try to add it into the Terminator, and then explodes into pieces. Which then 
Reese fell all the way down to the stairs and was dead, sadly. And Connor was um, also fell from the stairs too. Um, suddenly uh, got her leg broken or caught by one of the pieces that went straight into her leg and she took it off. And then she was trying to walk it off, trying to trying to trying to move as fast as she could so that way you can get away from the Terminator until she wants up going all the way straight to to where the uh, the crusher is and this is where she starts the the machine as the Terminator already already you know just half of his body is is, is there so he's still chasing her and then this is where she presses the button and, and she says, You're terminated, fucker! And then her, his entire body had crushed completely, and that's where you see all these, uh, <laughs> all these, uh, electroshocks appearing. So that means that he's finally gone. Terminated. Period. So Connor had, had been rushed straight to the hospital. And while well, Reese is already taken in a body bag, so now we lead to the next um, couple months already recovering from that incident that happened. But now she's about to move forward, going all the way to Mexico to start a new life with her newborn child that happens to be John Connor. Yeah. Which I know that's what's going to lead to the next story of, you know, a couple years from now. <laughs> Which is Terminator 2 Judgment Day. <laughs> okay. Um, but anyway, I know I, I went way too long on this, but I had to say it. I had to explain it. But no doubt about it, it's the quintessential sci-fi action thriller that would always be remembered no matter what and it's a classic <sighs> you just can't get enough of it now I'm going to get to the special effects here department it's impressive no doubt about it I mean even though it was ahead of its time but you gotta give a lot of credit for what they did so anyway all the special effects were done by I think um, a few teams joining in by Fantasy 2 the special effects company that's led by Gene Warren Jr. Uh, it, it's a company that's located in Burbank, California, where they created all the miniatures to, to make these effects set right with all these explosions and all these other set pieces. And they had to use like miniatures of of uh, a tanker truck or any of those droids and drones and even those um, cyborgs with, with robotics and everything that they put in even created the stop motion effects of the uh, electo of the um, the endoskeleton of the Terminator that just moves um, very uh, slowly fast I mean yes because this was at the time when with movements uh, of technology it was impossible to do so but that's how they did it back in the day because it's a small budget film but I love that, you know, how they use the, the, the looks of, and how it moves uh, slowly but surely here. Um, no doubt about it. So, yes, and plus, uh, Stan Winston created uh, the makeup effects uh, of the Terminator, you know, where he actually uses Arnold, and, you know, they had to add all this uh, human tissue and stuff, and they try to add the, all, all the skulls and, and the visor of, of the eye too directly I mean I know it's pretty tough to actually make that or even have having to add all these movements too like if I mean it took like hours to actually make all these adding all these makeup effects on Arnold's and it could be pretty uncomfortable but it's a challenge and I think they also added a, a puppetry for creating the movements of the Terminator so but yeah I mean it's again it's ahead of its time I know it does look pretty silly especially when you watch it on the blu-ray or DVD or any other but that's how they made it I really miss practical effects that they 
that they all have been done with puppetry and stuff. I mean, see, because they didn't use CGI back then for this movie. It's cool. I mean, and they, and they use um, they use the the pistol that they had, where it has the laser lights um, on top, which it can target to whatever victim it's it shoots. So that's why you'd be exceeded for it. Um, so it's called the Surefire. It has the laser sight, and they uses all the neon lasers and stuff with all these other guns and just everything they use. So I, I love that. Um, but anyway, that's exactly what you got for an action thriller. But as for the performances, though, um, yes, Schwarzenegger was definitely more than perfectly cast. He was excellent. Having to have a bodybuilder play a, a scary cyborg program to kill any victim out there, but most likely targeting one victim who happens to be the mother of the child that would turn out to be the leader of the resistance. You know, avoiding human extinction that's happened. Because now you can see why the future is a scary place. And this was essentially a different role for Schwarzenegger to actually play a villain. Because usually he doesn't play villains that often. He, he mostly plays heroes. You know, like he does in Conan and then all the later films he does. And of course he would soon become a hero in Terminator 2 Judgment Day. But the fact that he was a killing machine, terrorizing everyone, you know, going around killing everyone even though he sits on the real target on Connor. So, kept some going. Um, does have some amazing stunts and a lot of um, impressive action scenes. Uh, in fact, it's all um, photographed by um, cinematographer Adam Greenberg. So, he did a, an amazing job, you know keeping all the pieces together with editor Mark Goldblatt. Schwarzenegger was the right choice and I'm just glad he was cast. You know, upon uh, Cameron's uh, disapproval at first, but he finally proves himself wrong later on. But I don't know, but hey, it gets the uh, Not to mention uh, Linda Hamilton, um, excellent in this movie. Um, also excellent, she was beautiful. Uh, very attractive, uh, kind of sexy too, if you think about it. Um, but of course, she was at, at first, as we saw, she was a victim, invulnerable, but kind of weak. But next thing you know, her character starts to change later on, and she did uh, during the end scene where he finally defeats the Terminator that's going after her, and it shows that sooner or later she'll transform into. A very tough, tough and strong female character, no doubt about it. And it shows. And as for uh, Michael Bean, yes, um, this is also his best role too, and rightly so. I mean, he was—I'm going to say the word again—excellent. <laughs> All three of them are excellent. Okay, no, no doubt about it. They're excellent. Um, and I love the chemistry between both Reese and and Connor, and and I wish there were more of that too, because I know you could find that in the deleted scenes, even if they were cut in short. But I could definitely see the the long the the chemistry between the two and some romance going in, even when they had that sex scene. Um, also, there was flashback scenes too, when going forward to the future, where we where we begin to see some nightmarish scenes of of him, you know, trying to save uh, all humanity and trying to go after all these cyborgs uh, during the attack. I mean, he even joins in with um, his female partner, which before he got, she got zapped in. And then later he starts to save everyone, trying to go after another uh, cyborg who's dressed as human. So there was a huge attack that was going around. So. I love those scenes that they put in. And not only that, but the story. I mean, the story, 
even if you think of it as just a, a B-movie fair, I mean, the story is what made the movie possible. And that's what made it work, because the whole setting about, you know, survival between a war that's happening and, and it will not stop until it just continues. And so is the rest of the other actors joining in, like, uh, my, like uh, Paul Renfield, Lance Henderson, Bill Paxton, uh, Brian Thompson, among others. I mean, it's great to see them, and of course Dick Miller. So I, I can see why he was so huge. And I know it was troubling for the studio, Ryan, you know, trying to sell this picture because they were afraid that they were going to get bad reviews, and rightly so. So, but luckily for them, they finally uh, had a, uh, they finally had a chance, and they were. They're pretty amazed that this movie actually made uh, the number one at the box office uh, in two weeks. And so it earned its shares and it actually continued to go through all the way until it finally reaches home video. And that's where they made their sales. And then they had to go for involvements of a plagiarism that's being sued by all for, um, and yeah, which happens... Uh, by a writer named Harlan Ellison who wrote a story, a short story from an episode of The Outer Limits called Soldier, which this is where he starts to threaten to sue Cameron for infringement along with the studios to join in. So apparently um, by that acknowledge um, they settled in uh, two years later to actually uh, added some credit for Ellison for the original idea of of the short story that would soon become an episode and and that's probably what inspired for some reason to become the Terminator. So, yeah. Okay, I know. But I can see why this film had became so popular over the years and, and that's how we got, you know, a film franchise, T V series, the Sarah Connor Chronicles, of course. You know, video games, uh action figures and all these other stuff that we got it's just and the fact that it made Schwarzenegger a culture phenomenon and, and also made Cameron a a big star you'll never forget the wonderful score that's done by Bradford Dell yeah it has that that uh, synthesizer beat to it and the pounding that you hear like something like this Doo -doo -doo. Do, do, do. Do, do, do. Do, do. Yeah, it just fits so well for this film, uh, along with the rest of the other scores that's joined in to blend in for the story, and it's just, uh, that's how it fits directly for a, a sci-fi thriller that you never thought you would have, so. Anyway, it launches, but anyway, so at this rate, it's the film that launched the careers for Cameron's uh, film uh, career to join in with other films that he's done and launches everything that happens and that's how the Terminator became a name of its own. So anyway, <laughs> so that's the, the original film, The Terminator, and I give it a solid and incredible breakthrough of them all five stars I'm Joseph A. Sabora and as Arnold would say I'll be back for another review bye